And now, the Sleephawk Worldwide Podcast. Here are your hosts, Brandon Staten and Tyler Hensbro. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Sleephawk Worldwide Podcast. This is Sleep Dog with the Big Hulk. What's up, everybody? It's the Big Hulk. We got a great podcast. We also have beautiful weather here. Uh, we got a dub in Virginia. Uh, it is a great day to be a Tar Heel, and it's going to be a great podcast. I'm ready to roll asleep. God, Tyler got a nice little sunset back there. Uh, I got. I just realized on the TV behind me, I got the local news on. So uh, good luck to anybody watching on YouTube. If you're not, you should be subscribed to our YouTube channel. Got a lot going on, man. We got a big win, like Big Hawk said, uh, on the road, UVA. We're going to obviously unpack that. We're going to look ahead. Got three straight at home, starting in Miami. Then we got NC State. Uh, we'll preview those in some capacity and sort of segue into our boy down the road. Um Allegedly, definitely, maybe, possibly spraining his ankle in the court storming, and now all of a sudden everybody's up in arms. We'll give you our thoughts on what should happen to court storming. Um, and contender pretenders back. We'll get into conference, uh, get into March Madness edition, sort of. Uh, maybe even getting old Rick Patino, what he said, and then they turn around, and he wore all white, and they beat Creighton, and who knows. So we've got a lot to cover, but before we do, want to remind you that we're excited to be working with Autograph. They're co-founded by Tom Brady. Like I said, man, we're calls worldwide for nothing around here. The Autograph Phantom app gives you access to the best college basketball content, fan challenges, and exclusive rewards like discounted tickets for diehard fans, all for doing things you already do as a fan, like following your team in the news, listen to Sleep Hawk Worldwide, and more. Download the free Autograph app in the Apple App Store Use referral code SHWW. That's referral code SHWW. See you at the game. And we got that linked in our Instagram. It's linked here in our YouTube. Uh, we It's at the bottom of this episode. All kinds of places to find it. All you got to do is click the link, download the app, and you're good to go. Uh, like we said, you can earn points for listening to podcasts and um, a lot of other cool stuff. It consolidates. If you're a Carolina fan. I mean, this is this app for you because it puts everything in the same place. So go out there, check that out. Uh, it's a great thing to have as we start gearing up for the end of the college basketball season. Big Hawk, big win at UVA, man. What you think? I thought it was an amazing win. And before we say anything, I just want to say that I really do think that the coaching staff, Hubert, and the rest of the coaching staff, they deserve a lot of credit because we talked about with the bye week, and how sometimes when you give teams a significant amount of time off, they can come out just a little bit dull, a little bit flat, and I didn't think we did that. Uh, I thought this was a big win for us on the road against a, a team that we've – an environment that we've really struggled with in the past. Uh, you know, I think you talked about it. So we, we ended an eight-game losing streak at Virginia. Um, it's our first win there since 2012. And so we struggled there. And so for us to get this win, um, especially on the road after a long break, was huge. And if you were to say, hey, you know what? Armando's going to be in a little bit of foul trouble during the game. RJ is going to shoot one for, I don't know, 14 or something from the field. At Virginia, boy, you wouldn't think we had a chance. And uh, I really do think the player of the game to me is Cormac Ryan. And Cormac has taken a little bit of heat, uh, but what he did, he went 6 or 12 from the three-point line, 18 points. And also those points came in a time where we desperately needed them Mm -hmm. because you have to get out to a good start against uh, Virginia. You cannot play from behind because it is a tough game to play that slow and try to get momentum and also try to call your way back. And I really like that we got off to a little bit of a lead and made Virginia kind of play outside their normal style of basketball, uh, which was big. But uh, when I look at the game from an overview of everything and what I think we did really well, um, first of all, you've got to say we played great defense. Uh, When I look at what Virginia shot from the field, uh, Virginia shot 27% from the field. And That is not good. And when you hold, yeah, that is, uh, (laughs) you know, some people, some people can shoot better blindfolded. Uh, But I will say, (laughs) I think most people can shoot better blindfolded. uh, Well, 
sleep. What I will say, what I like about this is we've talked about it. This team's success is going to be dictated by their defense, and the way they continue to play defense throughout the re- the rest of the year is going to be the amount of success they see. Uh, because I really do believe that we have multiple guys that can score. And what I really like about this game is it shows that, hey, two of our best players didn't have their best game. Mm -hmm. We still clawed it out and got a dub on the road against a very disciplined, tough place to play. And I absolutely loved it. I thought our defense was great. Uh, And another thing that I really liked about this game is I really felt like our late game execution was much better. Virginia made a little bit of a run. And they cut it close. And every time that they got, I don't know, just close enough, we made big plays to really extend the lead. And I feel like this team's execution is getting much better, especially late in the game. And, you know, that's going to be very important come tournament time. And also you've got to say that, you know, when you when you have a young point guard, and I'm talking about specifically Elliot Cadeau, you've got like – I think he's got the amount of experience right now to kind of like say, you know what? He's really progression, progressing. I like where he's headed, and I feel like, yes, he's still a freshman, but now I feel like he has the experience to really execute and to really have a good impact on the game. And I, th- I really think that he keeps improving uh, and getting better almost every game now. I can see his confidence as he's gotten much better from the free throw line. He's starting to attack. He's starting to take players off the dribble. And also, he's our best passer on the team. Uh, I'm not sure what he had assist-wise against UVA. Yeah, Mm -hmm. six assists, one turnover. That's a heck of a night. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you can have a big impact without really scoring, and also, he's not the best shooter right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you can still find ways to get to the bucket when teams aren't really respecting your jump shot, that's ver- that's a lot of credit to him because he has the ability to get around people. He also has the ability to turn the Jets up and his, you know, from change of pace to kind of just jogging to sprinting is unbelievable. Uh, now he does lack a little bit of size, but, I mean, I really think that he's going to get better. He's one of those X factors. And also Harrison Ingram, we've talked about it, your guy, I'm not sure there's a player in the country that has that has had more of an impact as a transfer than Harrison Ingram. A lot of people will look around and say, uh, Hunter Dickinson. I I disagree. I think I think the transfer of the year to me is Harrison Ingram. And I love what he does. He's having a huge impact, uh, not only in scoring, uh, but his spirit. He plays unbelievably hard. He gives guys you know, he he's, he has great chemistry with the team, and also he's a great rebounder, and rebounding super important. And he's found ways to grab boards when we really struggled with it. And you know, you look at it; he had ten por- ten boards against Virginia, and mm-hmm. uh, he continues to really hit the boards. But also, you know, pre pod pre pod, we talked about Jalen Washington actually showed some some great spurts in this Virginia game. Now his box score and his stats weren't crazy, but he had a good impact. I mean, he, he blocked a lot of shots, played defense and he's improving. Even though some people may have lost a little confidence, you know, he, he shows you at times what he's Mm -hmm. capable of doing. And, uh, I, I hope he keeps progressing and becomes the player that I believe he can be uh, at some point. But uh, you know, we got back to Old Faithful, played defense, grinded out a win in a tough place to play. And, uh, you know, it was super important because we have that one game lead at top of the ACC over Duke right now. And so we're sitting all by ourselves. And, you know, the rest of it's just going to be, we can dictate, uh, you know, the rest of the season and where we want to end up in the ACC standings. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you just said. Like you said, you know, I think if we had thought that RJ would go one fourteen, we're gonna be in trouble against against uh Virginia. But we got down two to nothing. Last time the game was tied was two to two, and we pulled out thanks to Cormac Ryan, big first half for him, fifteen. I think he had uh five threes in the first half. We did exactly what you said we had to do, which is get out to a big lead. And we talked about it. Big lead not being twenty, not being thirty, right? Is is ten mm-hmm. or twelve, right? And that's exactly what we did. 
and we never trailed again. I don't even think the game ever, maybe it got to six once. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of those, there's like a lot of hidden meaning in a lot of these stats because it's, it can be misleading because possessions are at a premium in something in a, in a game like this where I don't know how many shots we usually get. I should have looked that up before we got here, but it's got to be in the 80s, right? Mm-hmm. We took 50, 50 shots, right? So, you know, when, when, when Harrison Ingram has 10 rebounds, I mean, the value of those possessions is almost 2x. When, when, when Jalen Washington has four blocks, what he's doing is when you get two or three, uh, you know, you have multiple blocks. It starts altering how people are attack, going to attack the rim. So it's like he might not be involved in every play from the sense of, you know, he's putting his hands on the ball, but he is, he's impacting the game. And when they're struggling to shoot and they can't come inside, um, <laughs> they don't have an answer. And so I thought his minutes, he played 12 minutes. Uh, I thought they were among the most impactful. Um, I mean, it's hard to say that Cormac Ryan's weren't <laughs> the most impactful, but it, I thought Jalen Washington's minutes had a lot of meaning in this game. And then RJ, you know, he is, you know, how do you go one for 14 and still manage to get double digit points? I mean, that guy's just a gamer. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nine of 10 from the free throw line. So he figured out, hey, the shot's not falling. He didn't stop shooting, which is is exactly what you want from him. Um, And, you know, he kept kept impacting the game. You mentioned Cadeau. Cadeau is so interesting to me because he struggled shooting this year. And you look back at some of the other guys, I think Marcus Page struggled his freshman year uh, with his shot. And, you know, I think maybe even Caleb Love was, was, uh, wasn't he pretty notably abysmal um, his freshman year? And then look at him now. You know, yeah. those guys both had great careers. So it's like, look, man, um, and his his ability to, um, you know, to, to influence the game in ways that the stats don't show, you know, to your point, his ability to change speeds and directions and he gets into the paint and it might, you know, he might not get an assist for a, a ball that he kicks out and then there's a swing pass and a guy gets an open shot. Right. But these are things that that matter. Um, and then you got Baycott, who, you know, got a couple early fouls and, you know, had to sit most of the first half and still winds up with a double double. Uh, one of those the first foul in particular, I didn't think was a very good call at all. But, um, yeah, I mean, this is a good win for Carolina. This is one of those win ugly games. And, and, and you know, you get out and you're leading at the half, hold the hold UVA, who doesn't score a lot. But 16 is they had just done that. And I think the game before. But before that, that was the lowest they'd ever scored. So, I mean, in one half, um, you know, and then you do what you got to do and to grind it out, like you said, and execute uh, in the second half. So I, I think this is a huge win, mm-hmm. maybe one of the bigger wins the whole season because because this is really like, I mean, look, we're, we're smart enough to know at this point that we'll sleep hawk worldwide curse, it seems like, on football. So we're not going to we're not going to like, you know, downplay Miami coming up or NC State. We've talked about how that's a rivalry game. Not even going to down, downplay Notre Dame, who got just absolutely shellacked over the weekend. Um, but yeah, I think this is one that that tests our metal, especially when you win this game convincingly with 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 RJ playing. Um, you know, his, probably his worst game of the season. So yeah, I think I think we're in a good spot. Um, now we come home. We got three straight at home. Mm-hmm. And get that, but you know, a decade we haven't won a decade in uh, at, at, at Virginia. So uh, just nice to keep the season rolling. And to sort of you know get back on track, we won one, lost one, won one, lost one. You finally win this one. You get a couple in a row, and then um, also um, you know kind of the long term monkey off our back because um, it seems like Virginia's had our number in football and in basketball for a long time now. So yeah, and, and sleep. You talk about it. Nothing good happens in Virginia, and mm-hmm. uh, I've never At heard all. that. Yeah. I, <laughs> I haven't heard that saying uh, until we started potting, and I absolutely love it. And it's very accurate uh, with most sports in Carolina. When we go to Virginia, I want to get out of there as quickly as I was I can. born there, guys. I mean, other than other than Hermie, yeah. ain't a whole lot of good stuff. Gloria, going on in Virginia. yeah, you guys, you, oh yeah, you guys, we'll go slip in. in. Yeah, slip in. Go over there, check out old Hermie. Slip in and then GTFO. Yeah, get out. That's of there. all I got to tell okay, you. Okay, get out and don't speed. Right. Don't don't speed in Emporia. Yes, per capita, speeding. more speeding tickets than anywhere else in the state of Virginia. Mm-hmm. I love driving through there because you know you ever you see everybody you know who knows because they're in the right lane <laughs> doing about five over, and you always see somebody just pumping on through with like Pennsylvania license plate or something. And it's like bud, and then go up and around a hump about ten percent of the time, which is a pretty good percentage if you really think about it. Mm-hmm. There they are down there at the bottom of the hill. Night night. Mm, see ya. All good right. Luck. Good luck getting back here for that one. I mean, <laughs> yeah. that's the court date. You don't want to, you know, go ahead and pay that one. Mm-hmm. Take the points. 
All right, Miami. We got Miami and NC State coming up uh, this week as you're listening. Um, Miami beat a night as we're listening. Come back home. What do you got for her? All right, so first of all, to kind of preview uh, the remaining games that we have left, four remaining games, so there's not a lot of season left, regular season. But sleep. these are why these three home games are so important. And one thing I want to say is, like, we are still battling out for a one seed. That is still a mm-hmm. possibility. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I really do believe that Arizona has a weak schedule because they're in the Pac-12. And if they lose it all, I think it's a monumental loss and it's really going to hurt them because the teams are so, you know, they're, you know, they're like quad three teams. But when you look at the, our remaining schedule, like you talked about Miami, first of all, you've got to take care of these and you can't think about seeding. You just got to go out there and win them. But for seeding, for people like us that run a podcast and we like to talk about it and we like to see what all the possibilities are, we'll break it down. Uh, so of the four remaining games left, Three of them are quad threes. So Mm -hmm. Miami, quad three, at home. NC State, at home, quad three. Uh, Notre Dame, at home, quad three. So if you are fighting for seeding position and trying to position yourself for, you know, to put yourself in a good seeding spot for the tournament, you can't lose these games because a quad three loss will drastically hurt your resume. Uh, First of all, uh, and then you finish the game with a quad one at Duke in any time. I don't care if they're a quad four, whatever quadrant they fall in, you always want to smack Duke at Cameron. It's an amazing feeling. And you can never beat them by enough because uh, Duke sucks and Duke will always suck. But back to uh, Miami. Miami hasn't had the season that they uh, kind of thought they would. Uh, they've had some injuries. Uh, Nigel Pack, one of their best players, set out last game. And nor Chad O'Meer is a very good big. Him and Mondo have kind of gone after each other a little bit, and they've had some good battles. And also Miami has been a tough team for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you've got to take care of that. You've got to focus on Miami and get that dub. Uh, but I do believe that Miami, uh, this point of the season and with the season that they've had, it looks like they're kind of gearing up for – We've got to throw everything into the ACC tournament and try to win the ACC tournament just to get into the big tournament, the big dance. Uh, So that's where I think they're at. NC State, obviously a rival, a lot of emotions. I don't care who they have or what type of year that they've had. They're always going to bring it and try to beat us uh, because they have nothing else going for them and they want to talk a little (laughs) smack to us. And we could beat them by a 1,000 and they'll still run their mouth. Uh, so they've lost any credibility for me, the Wolfpackers, but you've got to handle business, and you've got to shut them up, and you've got to get that dub, and they'll continue to talk, but we'll move on and do better things because we're not worried about them. Uh, and that's just what I think about the next two games, Sleep, and why I think they're so important because they are quad threes, and it's not necessarily that the win would help your resume. It's just mm-hmm. the fact that losing one of those games would drastically hurt your resume. Yeah, it's a slippery slope because you're right. I mean, all three of them, you know, we'll, we'll talk more about Notre Dame uh, come next next pod. But, you know, these are you – know, we've played a really tough schedule. I mean, we're net 14, I think I'm, I just saw. Um, net 14, net out-of-conference strength of schedule is 26. So, I mean, look, that's among the best teams in the country. I'm using Bet MGM. I got no idea what <laughs> – I got no idea what the official site for all this crap is. Everybody, everything's got a ranking. Our uh, official net is ninth right now. Yeah, I was gonna say I thought yeah. fourteen felt really low, but the betting odds those guys those guys know something we don't know. Yeah. Like maybe one of the referees mm-hmm. is uh, on the sauce. So um, yeah, I mean the, you're, it's a great point. Like these are games you just got to win. This is the hard part, really. I mean it's the easiest part of the season, schedule wise and like on paper. All these guys are at the bottom of the conference, but I mean, you can't forget that NC State and Miami both have winning records. I mean, you can say what you want about the ACC. Um, you know, the guys aren't playing that great in the conference. Um, I mean, NC State's got a winning record in the conference too, and in a rivalry game, anything can happen, sort of thing. So, you just got to stay focused. I mean, we're we are we're eleven and one at home, so. Look, this is this is what you play through all the hard games for. This is what you win all the close games for. The Virginias and the, you know, I don't know, whatever other thousand close games you want to pick from, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, you just gotta you gotta buckle up because now, I think now is when 
you know, now is when you'll be able to tell, like, are we a championship caliber team? Right. I mean, Mm -hmm. you, you, you got, if you've got bigger aspirations on this team, if you're a player on this team and you've got, you know, you think you guys got it in you, you got to win these games. Not, not just, you know, I think you got to start establishing some dominance in these games, especially if you want a one seed, you know, you went out and it'd be hard pressed to, you'd be hard pressed to convince me at least that this team doesn't deserve a one seed, but forget, forget winning out and getting a one seed. I'm saying, you know, you go out there and, and handle business in these games. Um, and then it's just, you know, I think you can contend against anybody. Yeah, I mean, look, the way that the season's been going so far, I mean, people, top 10, top five teams are losing every single week. Mm-hmm. So just go go do what you got to do and let, let everything else handle itself. I mean, look, Duke just lost. They were eight. We were 10. That's at least one spot. Um, you know, quit trying to keep track of who else is losing. So, um, you know, probably come out seventh, eighth, something like that, and got to figure over the last two weeks of the season that, Two, three more teams are going to lose, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking if we're a four, we're five or six, we still probably have a strong case. Um, we will not a be a, like if we if we do lose and we end up, oh, we yeah. would have no to chance. lose. Yeah, I, I yeah. do not see us slipping that much. Yeah. I think we have a very strong case for uh, a two seed right now, based yep. off our strength of schedule and mm-hmm. our body of work. Uh, Mm -hmm. A lot of teams in the net, like some of these SEC schools, I'm not sold on. I do not believe that Auburn's a better team than us. I do not believe that Tennessee is a better – we dog-walked Tennessee in the Smith Center. And you've got to look at that if you do do the seeding, if you're on the committee. You have to look at head-to-head matchups because, to me, that is very important uh, and uh, says a lot. But right now, I I would confidently say I think we sit in a two-seed right now. Yeah, I agree. I, and I also agree. You lose one of these, you can forget it. Uh, mm-hmm. So, and you just don't want to put yourself in that situation where you wind up, you know, getting the third or fourth two seed or three seed and you get in a place with this, you know, because you know, no matter what happens, they're going to put Duke somewhere where they're playing the, you know, yeah, they're they'll, playing the. They'll cater to them for sure. Yeah. Ain't no question. I don't know. I'm trying to think through my head of like some small college without, you know, really being, um, Offensive, so I'm just not even going to you pick your small college, and that's who they'll be in the same Liberty Biberty. They'll be playing those guys. Uh, let's see here. So, um, that's a good segue. Speaking of Duke, <clears throat> to this whole court storming fiasco. Okay, Kyle Filipowski. For anybody that's, I mean, this is one of those stories at this point. That unless you've been under a rock, I mean, I don't know how you haven't heard of this, but. Duke gets upset. Wake fans storm the court as they want to do. And Kyle Filipowski gets run into by a dude that's half his size. Kid does look like he's talking noise. Okay. But who knows? Maybe he said, hey, great game. Maybe he said, you suck. Maybe he said a little something more poignant. Um, Either way, Filipowski sprains his ankle. Now, I'm not a guy that's going to tell somebody that they're faking it, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm going to be real careful about that because I don't know for sure. All I know is it doesn't look like he sprained it. It also looks like he tried to freaking clothesline the kid. Not clothesline him per se, but like he, he, I thought he initiated the contact. And I watched that video 10,000 times. Now, I think it's safe to say that I'm (laughs) watching it through a very narrow lens, okay? I'm pretty biased on the other side, Um, full disclosure. But I watched it over and over and over again. I sprained my ankle 15 times, okay? There was no roll. And I'm thinking to myself, like, dude, this is drama, okay? And then... The whole sh- the whole scene pops out like they're helping him off. He's like crying. Okay, first of all, I've also sprained my ankle, and I mean it hurts. Okay, <laughs> spraining your ankle hurts. I ain't gonna lie, but I don't know if it hurts that bad. Okay, and then I mean it was it was a Paul Pierce moment. Like I thought they were gonna bring him a, a 
a stretcher out there, cart him off. And Shire gets in the middle of it. And then, and then, you know, in the post game, and I actually, this is a weird thing. Like, I mean, I hated Coach K, but like Shire is like, I'm kind of indifferent. Like, I don't say I like him, but he just mm-hmm. doesn't like create that same angst inside of me. Yeah. Um, but it, with, with that post game, when he was talking about that, I was like, dude, are you serious, man? Like, so anyway, all that being said, that paints the picture. You've had Caitlin Clark, uh, female, just absolute phenom. Okay. Mm-hmm. No, no way around it. She was involved in something too. We're going to unpack our thoughts a little further, but that sets the stage. So now the whole, you know, everybody's talking about, should they ban court storming? And I'm like, are we serious? Is this really a question we're asking here? Is this really the problem we're trying to solve? Um, so anyway, I'm going to shut up about it. What, what are your thoughts, Big Hawk? I'm going to come back to my opinion, but I'm nobody cares what I think. I'm banning court storming. And some people are extremely passionate about this. Listen, court, court storming has been going on for a very long time. Why all of a sudden now are we starting to have these injuries? That's something that I can't figure out. Why now are we starting to have these injuries? Uh, the Caitlin Clark situation scratched my head. Filipowski. Sus. I. Sus. And, and so the thing I think about is read the room. Like, are you not smart enough to put together that, hey, the students are staying around the court. They're about to storm it. Uh, brace yourself. And also, if one of those students did push, Filipowski can push them right back. I'm not condoning violence, but protect yourself. If someone comes up and pushes you, Okay you just as a man, you don't let people push you, but I'm not saying that that's what happened. All I'm saying is you had to have known that wake is going to storm the court. And in some capacity, why aren't you like understand that, Hey, these students are coming out here. And also I do believe that I think that court storming is a big part of college basketball. What makes it so special is the fan bases. And I think it is a, very exciting time for our students, especially for teams like Wake or other teams that, you know, they aren't fighting for national championships like Duke is. And to beat Duke on your home court is a special experience. And so a lot of the students want to run out on the court and share that moment with their players. And they get a lot of joy out of that. And I really do feel like it's a great sense of pride. Now, some of these students, if they run out there and they're a little reckless, mm-hmm. then they need to you know, you do something stupid, you should probably face, you know, you do the crime, you a do the time. Yeah, 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 exactly. And just like if one of these students were to uh, run up on Filipowski outside the basketball court, mm-hmm. you know, you've got to know like, hey, listen, we live in a society that has rules and you can't break these rules and you've got to know what's right and wrong. But if somebody breaks those and they've, you know, do the crime, you do the time. I am against, uh, I think court storming, is a great part of college basketball. I am not for banning it, and I actually uh, do like it. And I've been, I've been part of a lot of court storming, uh, unfortunately. And also, there's a great way to prevent court storming: is just win the damn game. Uh, that'll take care of everything. But obviously, I understand that's not gonna happen. I love it. I love it. And and that was where I was gonna go. It's like, have you ever? Were you ever in college? At least, were you ever in a court storming situation where you were on the court? Yeah, I mean, Georgia Tech. Were, they, sorry, where you were? Um, were you on the winning side? Never, right? No, um, I don't yeah. think so. So it's like it's, it's, it's coming from you matters a hell of a lot more than what I say because I'm the dipshit on the court, right? Like that's mm-hmm. you know sitting in the nosebleed. But but from somebody like you that has only really experienced it in that same vein, I remember when you guys lost Virginia Tech <clears throat> at Castle yep. Coliseum. I was on DTH sitting on the front row, and dudes are literally I'm on they, that at Castle. At least it used to be you sat right on the court side on the on the um, sideline, and kids are literally running like running over us, stepping on the desk like while we have our computers, <laughs> we're like hunched over. And it was like, it really sucked because I think you guys were number one mm-hmm. at that time. I remember it. And it sucked losing as a Carolina fan. <laughs> but it was also like, damn, you kind of envy that thrill because you just don't get that here. And I mean, look, I mean, even if you look, if you're Carolina and you're having a terrible year and somebody comes in there and you beat the you know number one team in the country, maybe, you know, and, and that's the other thing, too, is that Carolina or wherever. You know, people that say, oh, we're too good to storm. Dude, come on, man. Like, this is college, dude. Yeah. It's a great part of the game. 
Um, there are no injuries over this stuff. Like it's all made up. It's, it's crazy that, it, and what really pisses me off is like all these people in the media, like all ESPN and all these coaches and all this are like, this is like, it's the worst thing in the world. Like you mean to tell me with all the NCAA problems, all the societal problems, all the conference alignment problems, all this stuff, you want to ban court storming? Like this is what you're going to hit your wife. Yeah. Wagon to, especially when look, look, Filipowski is a star. Caitlin Clark is a megastar. Both of those situations did not look authentic to me. She looked up when she was running off the court. She saw that girl and she ran right into her. And then <laughs> Filipowski saw this kid coming and tried to give him like, you know, the right tackle and kind of whiffed at him mm-hmm. and like, embellished like the kid hit him and it, it hurt him and and again like i shouldn't say he embellished it because i don't i don't really know <laughs> all i'm saying is <laughs> i bet you he'll be playing in the next game and a, a sprained ankle like drake said ain't nothing to play with um for at least a game you know so i just i just it just struck me as sort of like i'm trying to cuss less guys on here <laughs> and it struck me as um bull crap which <laughs> sounds sounds awful but yeah i mean it's just i think it's it's ridiculous to, to ban court storming it's like you're not going to get hurt doing this dude I now agree. football totally different story tearing down the, this is a good mm-hmm. example when they're tearing down a field goal post like buddy that's dangerous okay yes. like that when you had about uh 17 or 38 fireballs and there's a steel post the size of missouri falling down and you were happen to be underneath of it, like it'll kill you. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and also my real court storming experience, I think I only had one is when in 2004, Carolina beat Miami in football, Connor, uh, Connor Barth field goal. And I was one of the first kids on the field and I jumped over hedges and they were like telling us, Hey, be careful and blah, blah. blah. And we didn't listen to a thing they said. As soon as that ball went up in the air, I tell you what, if you go back and if you could find any sort of footage, as soon as I, because we couldn't see what was happening because we're standing like, all we could see is the ball go up over the guys on the sideline and we took off. If, if he'd missed that field goal, it would, I think the game would have gone to overtime or maybe I don't remember if it was a game winner or like, or we were tied or what. But if it hadn't gone in, there'd have been 10,000 kids on a field and it had to get them all off. And so, of course, it goes in, and I'm running down in front of Miami fans because I'm in college, I'm young, and I'm an idiot. <laughs> and I start, you know, talking noise, and I turn around, and I'm almost certain, I can't remember, I got to validate whether he was even on the roster, but I was like five feet from Jimmy Graham. And I shut up <laughs> immediately. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to go back over here with my brethren here because mm-hmm. – uh I ain't chirping at that dude, especially in what is probably a a, sad, a a bad state of mind for him right now. So again, even in my like stupor, I wasn't stupid, right? Like I was, I was like having a good time. I'm like, dude, I ain't picking a fight with Jimmy Graham. Mm-hmm. It ain't nobody good. I won't like he like hit me one time and I'll just turn to dust. So like, look, man, I just feel like it's overkill to the max, and it's one of the most like authentic parts of sports period um why ban it because these guys i mean look somebody really gets hurt okay fine i mean you get hurt you know playing defense Mm -hmm. i just think it's bs anyway that's my rant um before we move on to contender pretender don't forget guys download the autograph app you can use the Sleep Hawk World by link. It's in our bio on Instagram. It's in our bio on this YouTube video. It's in our bio or it's in the description of this podcast. We got it on Twitter. It's in our links everywhere. Okay. Um, download the app. Tom Brady co-founder autograph one mission in mind. Change the fan experience for the better. The autograph fandom rewarded app allows devoted fans to unlock the most memorable experiences and awards. Get all the best college basketball content in one place. Read articles from your favorite team's blogs, and publishers directly in the app. Listen to the top podcast hosts like Big Hulk and Sleep Dog in the app. We are definitely listed there. Uh, Refer to your squad uh, and get rewarded together. You can uh, rank, level up for points, and you get points for all kinds of stuff, man. And it's it's a really cool concept. We've talked about it before. We'll continue to talk about it. Uh, cause they're supporting us and, and we certainly appreciate it, but it is go in there. If you're a, if you're a Carolina fan, use our link, go in there, check out the app, 
It literally has every single Carolina thing like plugged into it in one place. It's a brilliant idea. So it seems like something I would come up with. Uh, only the problem was Tom Brady did, and I didn't. Um, so start earning points for listening to podcasts. Download the autograph app. Use a referral code SHWW. Contender pretender, Big Hawk. We're going to do conference edition because we're getting down to the short rows here, trying to figure out what's going on, who's going to make the tournament. Who's not? All right. That's one thing. That's one piece of this whole puzzle. But there's a lot of chatter about conferences, which conference is good, which conference isn't good. So this is a special edition contender pretender conference edition. And basically the concept is this. I'm going to give you five conferences. Well, really, 4.1. You'll see, guess who that conference is. I'm going to give you these conferences, and you're just going to tell me whether you think they're a contender or a pretender. That doesn't mean that you're saying that the, the national champion is coming from this, this conference because then you wouldn't have but one contender, right? The point is, is like, are they going to make any noise? How are, you, how are we feeling about, hey, could, could some final four teams come out of this conference? So you okay with that? You ready? I'm ready. Big East. All right, so we look at the Big East, and there's one dominant team, and we know about that. We, uh, we have played them, and we've lost to UConn. UConn is the top dog in the Big East. They're a contender. Uh, the two other contenders uh, are Marquette. I'm not as high on Marquette. They have a point guard, arguably one of the best point guard, guards in the country. Tyler Kolick, he is fun to watch. They have a very dynamic player in Cam Jones. Uh, they are capable, but they have had some suspect losses, and they've been a little up and down. Uh, so I'm not as sold on Marquette as I am on UConn. Obviously, UConn to me is the best team in the country. Uh, after that, I'm going with a sleeper, and I consider this team a contender, and I think they're very capable. They have uh, Kulk, Tyler Kalkbrenner, who is uh, from Missouri. He's one of the best big defensive uh, players in the country. They have Baylor Shireman who can score. They also have this point guard named Stephen Ashton, who is a veteran fifth year transfer. He can get it going. He's very savvy. He's playing well. Creighton can turn it on, and Creighton has experience, and they're an older team. Uh, they also have a kid named Trey Alexander, who is an NBA prospect. Uh, when you have NBA prospects surrounded by older players and talented players, uh, I think your ceiling is very high. That's why I like Creighton. Uh, so those are my three teams from the Big East that can be contenders. Two teams I'm sold on, one team I'm suspect, and that's Marquette. Yeah, hard to pick against UConn right now. Even though they got blown out and so did uh, Marquette or, or uh, St. John's today, but I agree. Big 12. The Big 12. All right, so here we go. There's three teams I like in the Big 12, and I'm briefly going to touch on all of them. Uh, Houston. Okay, Houston is a veteran team. They play hard-nosed defense, and they will beat you up. They're athletic, physical, and they play good defense, and they are a little bit older. They have experience. That's why I like them. I haven't been as confident on Houston, but the more I watch them play, the more I like them. Uh, so I'm rolling with Houston. And then Houston is my top dog in the Big 12, and that has been a almost a 180 from what I've been saying mm -hmm. about Houston. Mm-hmm. But finally, I've come around. I'm a believer. I've seen them play enough. I like them. The next team I'm going with is going to be a surprise, and that is Iowa State. I think Iowa State is a big, athletic, physical, um, smart basketball team. They, will, they play great defense, and they have a lot of wins, and they have a high net ranking. I'm not sure what it is, but they have a great resume. They have quality wins, and they continue to get better and better as the season goes on. Now, this one might surprise some people. My third team in the Big 12 is Kansas. Kansas, I think, is the third best team in the Big 12. Now, I think Bill Self is one of the best coaches. I like Hunter Dickinson. Uh, I like McCuller. I like DeWan Harris. Um, forgetting one other player that's really good. But their starting four is as good as any starting four in the country. They lack depth, and they lack outside shooting. They're very suspect. And they've been a very sporadic team that has shown great flashes, but also they've shown some very bad flashes. And you know come tournament time, you know, it just takes that one bad flash and you're Dunsky. That's why I'm rolling with Kansas at three. My real contender uh, in the Big 12, my pick is Houston, and I've mm -hmm. finally become a believer. Like it. I like it. Audible here. Omaha. Uh, Big 10. 
I know. Ten, I know who. You, I know who you're coming out here. <clears throat> there's only one team noteworthy in the Big Ten, and that's Purdue. And every other team is not a contender. They will fall short. I think the Big Ten has really slid, and also they've been very suspect in the tournament. I will just say, in the Big Ten, you only see one style of basketball: the bruise it, beat you up style of basketball. And to prepare for the tournament, you have to see multiple styles. And that's why I think the ACC historically has done so well. If you look at the teams, there's different styles you have to prepare for. You look at Syracuse, you have to prepare for a zone. Okay, then you go back to Clemson. The old Clemson, when I was there, you had to prepare for an up and down against a press. And then you go down to Florida State, a hard physical basketball team. There's many different styles in the ACC. And I think that prepares you for the tournament. The Big Ten, you have one style. A lot of teams get shocked, and they never really have uh, the deep tournament run that a lot of people thought that the Big Ten teams would. The only contenders that is Purdue, and that's because they have Zach Eady, and Zach Eady's the best player in college basketball, the most dominant player in college basketball. Yeah, he. Uh, I, 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 I think I'll, I'll chip in a little bit here is that you know, what's interesting to me about Edie and, and, and his role is, I mean, that's the one thing too. When you're in the NCAA tournament, you got it. You got six games, man. You got to click, right? And, and having a guy like that, nobody else has that, right? And that's also a big X factor when you're going up in teams, uh, you know, don't have anything to counter. So I think his, his, his uh, importance is magnified in a tournament mm-hmm. setting. SEC. Okay. The SEC, uh, I almost put three teams. I almost put Auburn in there. I'm not a believer in Auburn. I do not think they're a contender. Um, A lot of people argue with me. I actually do not like the SEC. I think there's one contender, and that's Kentucky. But I'm going to throw in Tennessee because I think Tennessee has some – Sown, shown some flashes. And also I like Dalton Connect. He's been a player who has – He's a transfer, and he has gone from an unknown to arguably a top-10 draft pick in the NBA. He's had an incredible season. He can light it up. He can get hot. And also, they have another guard, Zakai Ziegler, who tore his ACL last year, uh, didn't really have the start to the year you know, coming off that injury, but looks like he's got some momentum lately, and he's been playing well. He's been providing Tennessee with a big spark. That is the only reason I have them as a contender. Uh and my uh, my thought is a little skewed with Tennessee. We absolutely destroyed them in the Smith Center, dog walked mm-hmm. them, and we made them look so bad. Where I just don't see that team being a deep tournament run team. But based off of what they've done against everybody else, I'm going to add them as a contender. So SEC, two schools, Kentucky and Tennessee. Watch out. Merry Christmas, Big Blue Nation. Okay, you guys are freak shows, man. Big Hawk is unbiased news source. Okay, get it right. Next up, Pac-12. Pac-12. What is a Pac-12? There's only one team in the Pac-12. All right. Pac-1. Yeah, it's, it's pretty Lone soon. Wolf. Yeah, we're going to have a couple of them schools in the ACC. <laughs> There's one school, and that is Arizona. Arizona's done, you know, they've had a tough strength of schedule outside of the Pac-12. That's why they've had uh, a high net ranking because every other team in the Pac-12 is not hasn't had the year or hasn't been – you know, quality team. And I will say Oregon's gotten a little strength and there's some buzz around them, but I'm only a believer in Arizona. Uh, Omar Balo is a big who I probably just butchered his name. He's very strong. He's physical. He dominates the paint. Caleb Love, he's playing unbelievable. I do think that the transfer to Arizona really helped him and it really helped us as well. I mean, you got Mm -hmm. to see like, it worked out for both sides, and so I'm happy to see Caleb having a good year. I do think Arizona is a contender. They're athletic. They're well coached. They could make a deep tournament run. Man, I hope. I, look, dude, if <clears throat> can't even really think this way, but if things, let's just put it. Let's, I'm going to soften soften this state, oh, statement a little bit. If if things don't go well for Carolina, I'll be pulling for Caleb Love all day long, man. I, I hope mm-hmm. he. Uh, I think he's he's resurrected. His, it's hard to say he's resurrected his career. I guess after last year, you know, nobody had a lot going on. But uh, man, he's a, he's a fun kid to watch play. Man, I, I, mm-hmm. I wish only the best for him. Obviously, if it's us and them in the final, he'll beat the stuffing out of them. Um, <laughs> last but not least, what everybody came to see, the ACC. The ACC. 
the best conference in the history of basketball, college basketball. There's no conference that has had the success that the ACC historically has had, uh, and they never get the credit, but they continue to make deep tournament runs, whether it's Duke, whether it's UNC, whether it's Virginia, whether it's Miami. We are the most underrated, underappreciated conference in college basketball, and we will continue to dominate the NCAA tournament. Uh, Never forget it and always let them know. Uh, There's three contenders in the ACC. I could add some more, but I'm not. Uh, because there's only three true contenders, I could make a, I could form an argument for some other teams, but that wouldn't make me look too smart, and it's hard <laughs> enough to do anyways. So the top dog, the Tar Heels, of course, we got the Tar Heels. They are the number one team in the ACC. They can make a deep tournament run. We are a big believer. We are unbiased. Uh, I like our pieces. Uh, I like the way we're trending. Every time I feel like we've taken a step back, we we bounce back mm-hmm. and play better the next game. Uh, Hubert Davis, you got to give him a lot of credit and the Ton. coaching staff. They've done an unbelievable job and they've, you know, changed the perception. And after what they went through this year, unbelievable season. They're the top dog in the ACC. They're a contender. Moving next to Duke. Duke hasn't had the season that a lot of people thought uh, they would have um, before the season started. A lot of people hyped them up just like they usually do uh, because they didn't do their research. Listen, it just seems like everyone's going to say Duke's going to be good because Duke's Duke is Duke, and mm-hmm. usually they are good. But I'm not a sold in Duke, uh, as a lot of people. I think they've had some odd losses. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think they've reached their ceiling. I think they have a high ceiling, and I do think that they have potential to make a deep tournament run. I don't think that this roster has played close to what they're capable of playing. Uh, you've got to give Filipowski a lot of credit. He is a dynamic big Mm -hmm. uh and jeremy roach is an underrated guard he can get you a bucket he also has continued to give steady work throughout the whole year uh i just don't think that uh they have the big physical bruiser down low i don't think uh ryan young really cuts it and i think Mm -mm. to really this team needs that big you saw it last year lively came on late in the year really provided them with a spark lively Mm -hmm. went to the nba uh, he's had a pretty good well rookie. In NBA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's had a pretty good rookie season, and it just shows you what defense and having a rim protector really does. And I think if they don't have that, I don't think I think Filipowski has to try to be a banger, and I think that wears him down. I don't think he's fit for that. Uh, so I think that's where they get vulnerable. Uh, but they do have athletic players, and they have players that have potential. That's why they're a scary team. They could make a run. John Shire, he's also – he's done a pretty good job at Duke. I mean, he's mm-hmm. – you know, he, he's done a good job. Got to give him got to give him a little credit too. But my third team is Clemson. I think mm-hmm. Clemson is a deadly team. And I didn't really like the perception that when we lost to Clemson at the Smith Center that we had a letdown because I, I think that Clemson is a team that doesn't really get the respect. They have P.J. Hall, unbelievable player. He can play at the NBA. He's dynamic. He can do inside and out athletic, has size, and is strong. In Shefflin, he is a grind, grinded out big. He is an X factor. He can make winning plays. And then Joe Girard, he's one of the best shooters in the country. I do think that Brad Burnell has done a good job with them, and I think they're capable of making a deep tournament run. If you look at what they did before the conference play started, a lot of people had them pick to win the ACC and make a you know, an argument to to make a deep tournament run. I still think they're capable of that. I think they could win the ACC tournament, put themselves in good position. Uh, but I do like their potential. So the three contenders, UNC, Duke, and Clemson. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I feel like, you know, one of the last things on on the Duke situation, first of all, yes, Cal Filipowski is a great player. Okay, so we- – <laughs> Notwithstanding not my what comments, we're saying, guys. yeah, not my, notwithstanding my comments, not a great actor, uh, potentially. Okay. Um, but I think what they miss in their roster is, you know, that sort of mid size, you know, um, like six, seven, six, eight sort of power forward athlete. You know, they don't really have, I guess you call it a stretch four or whatever, right? Like they just don't seem to have that transition threat that is just going to dunk on you. Yeah. Um, a lot of good guards, a lot of good, you know, fundamental um, sort of size. But, but yeah, they don't seem to have that sort of freak athlete guy. Like, I mean, Zion is, Zion was 
I mean, he, he didn't athlete. make the kind of impact that he could have, and and they've had plenty of others, and and so have we. But I do think that, um, that that's part of what they're missing. But yeah, so there you have it, folks. We got a whole rundown on uh, on the tournament. We got you know Miami coming up tonight. We got NC State coming up Saturday, and then this is the last week of college basketball season, dude. It's crazy. Wow. Hard to believe we're there already. Mm-hmm. Sleep dog might have a kid by then. So we're getting close. Um. One other thing before we get out of here, I just wanted to mention regarding autograph, instead of me just doing your old flat read here, uh, they're doing a sweepstakes and they're going to bring people uh, out to um, eight friends to the round of eight game in LA and a suite at the crypto arena, crypto.com arena includes flights and lodging. You can enter by referring a friend to the app between now and March 15th. So go check out the app, use the link in our bio. It's plastered mm-hmm. all over the place. We'll share their social posts about it. We'll share some stuff about it too. We'll sleep dog and big hawk might be uh might have a trick up our sleeve as well. So guys, make sure you got the app downloaded. They're supporting us. So one of the best ways you can support us is support them. Uh and don't forget about Jimmy's man. Day one. Jimmy day one. Crab mm-hmm. cake cook cra- chocolate chip cookie of the sea. Go get your Jimmy's famous seafood, man. They'll mail the box right to your door. And I'm telling you, man. We still we keep it stocked in a freezer, dude. Dude, it's like meal prep. They got meal prep there, dude. Oh yeah, we like legitimately eat healthy food from Jimmy's Famous Seafood. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's good too. What's the Angus Barn yesterday? It wasn't that good. Oof. Angus Barn, hmm. cheese. Yeah, <laughs> cheese is nasty there, man. <laughs> Hot take, dude. They get a bunch of crumble like uh, I don't even know what kind of crackers those are. And ice cream scoop full of cheese and mashed potatoes, man. I don't know. Angus Barn don't do it for me. Anyway. Christmas time's nice. You got anything else, Big Hawk? Stay safe. Stay safe.